I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're a little early, but again, we got a full house. So this is the Mac and iOS management made easy session, the Casper way. Uh, my name is Kevin Snook. I am from Appalachian State University. I am the Apple Systems Administrator. I am part of the desktop management team of Technology Support Services of Appalachian State. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions for me after this, anytime, hit me up on Twitter or, or just send me an email. These slides will be available afterwards as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about App State in our history. I'll give you, actually, first of all, show of hands, who all here is using Casper Suite right now? All good. That's good. So um, you came here to kind of compare what you're doing versus what we're doing. That's good because I want to compare what I'm doing with what you guys are doing as well. Who here is looking to buy Casper Suite? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. And who here is using one of the other open source Deploy Studio, Puppet Monkey? Radmind, anyone still using it? <laughs> Go way back. So a little bit about App State. Uh, we are located in Boone, North Carolina, 3,300 feet above sea level. So we are in the Appalachian Mountains. We have uh, 2,700 faculty and staff. And we have 20,000 students. And this year we renewed our Casper license for 2,000 max. We are centrally um, distributed. IT, so we have a central IT with distributed um, IT staff that are still working for central IT. We have 6,600 Windows machines as well. We have 400 plus managed iPads in Casper. And we have 200 unmanaged. They're in our inventory, but they're not a managed client. And we have two Mac admins. And we have five Windows admins mm -hmm. for all that. Distributed, we have 50 support techs. That includes our library techs, all the colleges, all the buildings, all the labs. So if you look at those numbers, our ratio is 161.4 devices per tech. This is why Casper was so important for us at App State, because we were just getting overwhelmed by devices. So before Casper, we had about 400 Macs, and we were growing Macs exponentially. Every year, we got double the Mac that we had the year before. And we were doing the same thing everyone was doing, carbon copy cloner, uh, you know, cloning images, making one big fat monolithic image, running out there with firewire drives, or doing a net install, net deploy type thing. We started working with Casper, or I'm sorry, with Jamf. Composer for ARD version 4 was in this time frame. And we started building packages and we thought, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, we can build these packages and use ARD and send them out. And at the same time, we were using Radmine for our, you know, deployment and our packaging. Radmine was great. It was open source. It was free. At some point, Radmine stopped being good for us. We were looking at it and we said, well, you know, the, the development of Radmine is starting to get stagnant. It's not keeping up to date. It's very difficult for distributed IT to use Radmine. Just the two of us internally could build the packages. And so our, our time to package deployment was request, maybe 30 days later, we could get a package out there and into an image that they could actually deploy. So we had to find something different. So we started looking at what were our goals in a new system. We wanted Mac first, Mac specific. We looked at a number of products, I won't name them on this slide, I'll name them later, that said they do Mac support, they do Mac imaging, they do iOS imaging, but they kind of just tacked it on to the end of their Windows support. Um, you probably run some of those now. They don't work well. I'm here. So we didn't want that. Must keep up to date with Apple. This was one of our biggest problems with Radmine is it just seemed to, you know, when a new OS came out or a new, new apps, and, and when I say keep up to date with Apple, I mean the Apple community. So a new app would come out, CS4, we couldn't really package it right. It just wasn't keeping up to date. 
uh, full featured was low total cost of ownership. And I say low total cost of ownership. We were working with a $40 or $50 piece of software, which was our um, Jamf composer for ARD, and a free RadMine system. So we knew free wasn't going to work for us, but low total cost of ownership. And I'll get into some numbers in the next slide. And plays well with standard technology, just, you know, that's, everybody likes that. And simple to use for all support techs. We have distributed techs and their level of skill set is varied. Some are really good. Some you need crash helmets and so they don't fall out of their chairs. Uh, it's just the way it is. So we basically wanted this. Hello IT, have you tried turning it off and back on again? You know, that's what we were looking for. Oh. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That's my appeasement to the, uh, the, god, the demo gods here. So we reviewed a lot of um, products, and Firewave was one that we looked at first. We, kinda, we really liked it at, at first. Um, it was Mac's first, Mac specific. We looked at KBox. KBox is one of those, oh, we do Mac too, tink, 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 right at the end there. Big fix, same thing. We do Mac too. No, you really don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, Net Octopus, that was an old one. Jeez. Um, Puppet Monkey, I mean, these, these Puppet Monkey Deploy Studios are really good solutions. And I don't have anything bad to say against those. But what we were looking for was more of an all in one solution that we could hand off to the library admins and say, there it is, go do it. We don't have to, you know, hammer it into what we need to do. So we settled on the Casper suite. So why? Why Casper? Oh, <laughs> All right, so it is Mac first, Mac only, and I, it, it's the best. It really is. I'm, I'm not being paid by Jamf. I don't have any, I've been with, I've been a Jamf customer since 2006. And it really is just push button simple. All of our techs can use it. Uh, at the time, it was no Windows Server required. That was one of our big, we didn't want to have to turn this over to a systems group for management. We wanted to be able to manage it ourselves. You know, the newer versions of Casper, you can run on Linux and Windows servers, which are great if you want to VM it and run it that way. But at the time, we just were Mac only and didn't want to have to have anyone else running our servers. And the nice thing about Jamf is these guys were Mac sysadmins just like us. They worked at Eau Claire, Wisconsin Eau Claire, and other universities. So they knew what kind of pains we have. And lowers our total cost of ownership. We just renewed this year 2,000 Macs, 400 iOS devices. We are education, so we get an education discount. The cost of our annual agreement with Jamf is about a third of a full-time employee. So we're able to do with two Mac admins plus Casper for a third of a full-time employee. If we got rid of Casper, we'd have to hire at least one full-time employee just to feed on the street, probably two more full-time employees. We've kind of looked at the hours we're saving. So take that back to your departments. If money is an issue, you know, you're, you're saving. It, well, the way we're looking at it is we're not going to cut people. Casper's not going to come in and get two people fired. We're going to grow our max and not have to grow our staff. So that's the way we looked at it. And it does keep pace with Apple. I think Jamf claims that they're uh, plus one, day plus one for releases. In some cases, it is same day release. 10.7 comes out. The new Casper comes out. You're up, you know, 10.8 comes out. The new version 8.6 will be out. So really good community. And it's easy to use for central and distributed IT. OK. So those of you not familiar with Casper, it's got a suite of applications. I won't go over all of them. They've <coughs> gone over these in a lot of sessions. But it's, the heart of it is a web-based application called the Jamp Software Server, JSS. And then you layer on that with Casper Admin, 
composer to build your packages, admin builds your task sequences and your configurations. Recon is how you get your computers into your inventory and how you get them into the management system. I'll just go through these quick. So imaging remote and then self-service. I want to talk a little bit about self-service. This was a game changer for us and it should be for you as well. When we were first installing Casper, we didn't have self-service. We were a customer before self-service. Self-service came in in version 6. We're at version 8.5 now. Um, it has enabled us to do things that just make our lives so much simpler. We can build a, a printer package. Put We're a Faro shop, so we can take Ferros drivers, Ferros installers, printer drivers, printer packages, collect them all up, throw them in self-service. Anyone wants to print to a Ferros printer, just click on the installer. It's done. It's so easy. All right. Let's get into some situations. And I'm going to open this up as well. I kind of see this as a boff a little bit because I want to hear as much from you guys as I don't want just up here telling you what we're doing. So as far as inventory management, here's a few of these um, that we use all the time. So inventory management. Before Casper, we had a guesstimate of how many Macs we had. We had less than a guesstimate of what they were running OS-wise, application-wise. Just didn't know. Had no, no way of, we, we didn't have any way of uh, tracking it. With Casper, I can run any report on any part of that system. <coughs> Who were the Macs that have 90% of their hard drive filled and running 10.5 and need an update and I write a little uh, search, custom search in my inventory, I pull it up. I know everything that's happening to every one of my Macs at any time. Real big, important for me. Remote control. Before Casper, our help desk had to have a copy of ARD. You know, it's not a whole lot. What is like 300 bucks for a copy of ARD? With Casper, they just have a copy of Casper. It's part of what we get. We can put Casper Remote on as many machines as we want with our one license. So all of our help desk have Casper Remote. User calls in, I'm having problems. They screen share to there, do their thing. We can scope the help desk users into a group in AD pull that group into Casper and say, here's what you can do. The help desk can only remote to machines, maybe push a few pack or maybe push packages. You know, they can't image things, they can't delete things out of the inventory. You can scope all that. So you have different groups. We have a tech group, a help desk group, an admin group. All those groups are built in AD, fed into Casper. So management of our users is very simple. Admin group can do everything except for core server um, settings. Techs can do everything except for core server settings and, you know, deleting stuff. And like I said, um, it, it, you know, they can do imaging. And so you get that, that management at a granular level of, of your different users. The usage management, a little different. Um, usage management, we can run reports and say, kind of like a key server, we can say who's running Adobe CS5. It doesn't limit them. If we have 20 copies of CS5 and we have it installed on 30 machines, all 30 could run it. Casper won't stop that, but it will tell me when I'm hitting those machines so I can either true up my license or I can you know, make it right. So we actually have, oops, we've gotten rid of our key server and using Casper, saving $40,000 a year of a key server license that we don't have to pay for anymore by having usage management in Casper. Again, it won't restrict it, but it'll send me an alert and say, all right, you're, you're using more than what you're allotted for. So then I have to come back and say, all right, we either need to buy more license or we just need to stop people from using it and take it off machines. But we're saving $40,000 over a key server license. Because we weren't using key server 
to restrict, we were just using to track. Restricted software is a great feature. With restricted software, you can have a blacklist, basically. So all of our BitTorrent clients and labs, put them in there. As a new one comes out, we put it in there, try to stay ahead of that game. Um, you can say, you know, you can't install, or you can't run the App Store, you can't run, and, and it's all granular. So this group of Macs can run the App Store, this group of Macs can't run the App Store. It's really good. Can you set those groups up through OD? Through, yes. Through OD? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can restrict by user, so if that user's in a tied to that machine and that's pulling from OD, yes. Yeah, it's uh, AD, OD, ED, if you're still using the e directory. Yeah. So you can you can make smart groups based on users, and you, you can make smart groups. AD earlier is why I asked a question uh, as you're going along there, and you said you can manage this from AD. It's like an alarm bell. Right. So what what we do there is in in my Casper uh, JSS in in the management tool of Casper. I'm not adding users individually to Casper. They, I have groups that are pulled from AD. We add them in AD to those groups, and they're instantly got all the rights to Casper that that group would have. So it keeps my management real simple. Again, license management, so we can track applications and all, all kinds of reporting. I can run a report on any little detail that's in my inventory iOS management, we've had a couple sessions this week on this, so I'm not going to go into this too much. Uh, I would suggest looking back at, at like Justin's um, presentation from yesterday. It's Justin and Scott's. But briefly, you know, it's the same thing, inventory management. We didn't know how many iOS devices we had until we started enrolling them and manage them, managing them in Casper. Now we know what which ones need iOS 5? Which ones, you know, are iPhones versus iPod Touches? And, um, which ones are Verizon? Which ones are AT&T? Because the way we do it at App State, um, departments just buy what they want using App State money. They'll buy an iPhone. It's a Verizon. No one told them to. You know, we have a... Actually, they'll buy an AT&T. We have a Verizon account, but they'll buy an AT&T one. So we can track who's buying the AT&T ones so that two years later when their contract expires, we can say, okay, switch over to Verizon. So you can do all that kind of inventory tracking. Um, volume purchase, app distribution, and management. Uh, th this is a great feature. What we can do, we have a volume purchase set up. We can buy the apps at a discount, buy them in packs of 20. Um, we put them into Casper. We distribute the codes, the redemption codes through Casper. People come in, and, and we treat them like consumables at App State. So any managed iPad, if they're in the right policy or right group, they can get you know Quick Office Connect Pro HD, ten dollar app. We just when we start running out of apps or redemption codes, we buy more. We do a billing with our help desk system. We do a billing. If they purchase it, and it's that simple. We don't worry about things. We don't try to restrict who can get what. We just we buy it like a consumable. It works great for us. And the free app distribution, you know, that's kind of overlooked sometimes, but there's hundreds of thousands of apps in the App Store. And we have certain ones, like we have a Junos Pulse VPN client we need to use because we don't use Cisco, we don't use the built-in VPN on iOS devices. Telling someone, go out to the App Store, do a search for Juno's Pulse, VPN client, not Juniper, not Jupiter, not... They just go to self-service on their iOS device, oh, there's Juno's Pulse. Install. Done. So we can collect these free apps that we know they need and put them into self-service for them. Uh, restricted software, you know, you can turn off Safari or turn off App Store and iTunes and remote wipes. You know, our chancellor has an iPad, has an iPhone. If the chancellor loses his iPad, we need to make sure that data is gone and all the reporting. 
Oh, this is a new feature. We ha we're not using this yet, but it's something that's getting a lot of buzz on our campus. It is, you know, the iBooks author, they want to write an iBook, build an iBook. How do we distribute it? We can distribute it with Casper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about this one. Uh, web clips are great for iOS. Web, you know what a web clip is on iOS. It's just a, looks like an app, but it just takes you to a website. We deploy web clips in our self-service for, for certain web services that we have on campus. An example would be support.appstate.edu, which is our ticketing system. So we can put a web clip on their, on their iPad so they can get in touch with us. But you could do that for the web mail or for the banner systems or whatever web services you run at your campuses. Imaging. How do we use Casper for imaging? So we're all modular. That's the feature of Casper that really sold us in the beginning. We were monolithic images that we laid down in summer and we didn't touch them unless you know the earth was splitting open and, and there was no, no other choice. With Casper, everything's modular and we build the modules. So I put an OS package out there and I put an Office package and an Adobe package. The techs choose what they want in their labs. It's a la carte. They say, well, I know I need an OS, and I'm a math lab, so I need Fathom and MATLAB and this and that and that. And they just build their own configurations. We've built the back end. They pick what they want. If they need to update it, new version of MATLAB 2012A comes out which happens way too often. Um, we can package that up very quickly, run a, a um, composer snapshot package, put it in their lab, it updates their lab automatically, and if they have policies in place, they either re-image their lab on occasion, um, it's just updated, just automatically updated for them. The end users in the text don't have to worry about it. We, we take care of it. Uh, custom configurations, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, we make the packages, they decide how they want to use them. Pre-stage and auto run. This, this is something, I don't know how many of the other systems can do this. Casper does this really well. So I know I have 10 iMacs coming in to my campus and I can scope them via serial numbers or, or set, we have a, a setup VLAN so we have this network segment. When they get connected to that network segment, on the back end, I have already built a configuration that said, I'm going to have 20 iMacs. They're going to hit this network segment at some point. When they do, image them with this configuration. Plug up the iMacs, turn them on, get them connected to the setup VLAN, and they start imaging. That's it. Zero touch. I mean, I don't have to go and type in my password. I don't have to pick my configuration. Just done. Same thing with auto run in labs. We set auto runs. We set them to um, go without any touch, without any wait. You make a policy that net boots those machines once a week. They net boot. Casper imaging comes up. Auto run kicks in, re-images them, restarts them. They're fresh. Once a week, you can image your labs Saturday night. Library does that a lot. Library gets hammered with stuff. We, uh, another thing, we don't use deep freeze anymore. Casper's replaced deep freeze. That's another savings. Casper with policies and, and maintenance policies and auto runs. and You can make it so every time it reboots, it re-images. Wouldn't suggest it, but you could. But with a maintenance policy, you can come in and clean stuff up that people have put on there or uh, we have a ton of different cleanup scripts we call them depending on the on the feature so we save money with key server we save money with deep freeze for max can you manage where they're uh, getting their numbers from can you tell them get a get from this vlan over here yes yeah you can we have we have eight admin vlans eight student vlans a setup vlan and we have them all in casper 
this is the network segment for this VLAN. So if anything comes across with this IP address, I know it's in setup, which is 44 for us. Anything in the 44 subnet, setup VLAN, kick it off. If, I mean, if I set it pre-stage. So yes, I can say. Well, you can say, here's a MAC address. When this starts, I want it to get a number from over here. Hey. From this VLAN? Um, that would be the way it's registered in our registration system. So no, I, we, we boot them into a, a closed network basically, you know, a closed switch. So when they're plugged into that switch, they come up and, and they get into that setup VLAN. Once they enter your open environment, you gloss <laughs> that setup environment totally then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because then they'll have a permanent IP address. So they get in the setup VLAN, they get a temporary IP address in the setup VLAN. They get imaged. Are you managing 10,000 machines with uh, static IPs? Yes. It's dynamic but assigned. It's manual but dynamic. What's that? Am I using info blocks? No. <laughs> um, but yes, you can, you can do network segments. Uh, management, SSH and admin account. That lays down at imaging. You can hide the admin account, which is great now. So we, during the imaging process, I think that's the next one too. Um, so we'll lay down during imaging. We'll partition it, put the recovery partition for 10.7. Um, we'll lay down a hidden admin account. Make sure SSH is turned on so it can do its talk back to uh, Casper. Set any open firmware passwords. We set AD bonds on our imaging. This is something you do have to set either in your auto run or if you're doing a manual imaging, you have to change from custom or change from uh, regular to a custom configuration. But you can do your AD bonds during imaging. Really saves us time. We have a, a bind, it's not really a script, but it's a, a bind setting in JSS. So if we set the auto run, now you don't want to bind a machine more than once, so you've got to be careful with that, but you, we, do all, we can do our binds on imaging. Settings. All right, so what kind of settings managements do we do? Account management. Again, hidden accounts, AD accounts. Um, we've gone, we just recently went to AD for Max. Max for a long time, we're running local account, Fluffy's Mac, I log in as Fluffy with no password, and I run all day, no password, and I'm an admin on that machine. We are systematically going through cleaning up those Fluffy accounts, replacing them with an AD login. We can do that with Casper. We can migrate data and then blast that account, bind it to AD, get them to log in properly, and bring their data back. Manage clients for OS to MCX. Before Casper, we ran open directory servers for primarily for MDX or M MCX. Um, with Casper, we do all of our MCX, and now we're moving to configuration profiles, but we do all of our MCX from Casper. We don't run an open directory server or infrastructure at all anymore. We don't have any any E directory or, or open directory. We used to have A D, E D, O D all running at the same time, happily fighting with each other. We run AD and Casper for everything else. Really has cleaned up what I have to do as an admin. Makes things a lot cleaner. Maintenance policies. This is what I'm talking about um, replacing deep freeze with. So we set up these policies that are triggered usually at logout, because in our labs especially, you know, students log in, they log in with their AD credentials. They start doing stuff and filling up the hard drive and downloading music. Or do, and we have mobile accounts, so it's a local, you know, local that's um, cached and, and synced. So in the library especially, they'll start filling up with dozens of accounts that get created from people logging into these machines. We can have maintenance policies that come through. This one in particular in the library checks against a whitelist of good um, accounts that are in OS 10. 
If it's not one of those accounts, it deletes the account from the machine. They're supposed to be saving their data onto sticks or onto the, what we call our U-Store. It's just a, a, a SAN that we have. So we're able to come through and clean up the Mac at logout every time, over and over and over, just like Deep Freeze would kind of do. It's a little more complicated than Deep Freeze because Deep Freeze just throws it back to the, the base. You have to get your policies just right. But the fact is you can save a lot of money by not having a Deep Freeze contract anymore. Printers and dock items. If, uh, if a lab really wants to force the dock items, so every time someone logs in, the dock is set up. We have some teaching labs where this is really important. So a user logs in and the, the dock is exactly the way the professor wants it, every time. If they um, somehow delete a printer, or, or in our, our case, if they need a new printer, we can have a policy that just throws a printer out there for them, one login, and takes it off one login. So we can set up teaching labs that switch over depending on what they're teaching. And then all the directory bindings. We use AD, but it can do OD likewise. And I mean, it, it ties in with all these other um, directory tools. But it works great for AD, which is all we are anymore. And any script you ever want to run, you can run with Casper, whether it's Apple Script or Shell Scripts, Perl, Python. Is there any I'm missing? Probably there's some I'm missing, but. So we have, you know, we get some students that come through that are just way smarter than me. I'll admit it, they're smarter than me. We hire these students and they're, they're killer Perl scripters. Okay, great, we'll use you. Write a Perl script that does this, and they do it. We incorporate it into Casper. We get another one who's, you know, a bash script expert, that's great. But, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old Apple scripter, so I can still get in there and I can Apple script, yay. And the open firmware stuff, which that's not that big. All right, software distribution and patch management. Like I used to, uh, like I said before, Casper, we would build the image in the summertime. If you requested a software update, TFB. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be 30 to 90 days till we can get that. Uh, uh, and, and it really was our policy. We told someone, I think it was, we had a 90-day policy for, for any new app. So that would, we'd try to push that through the semester. That's why we set a 90-day policy. Now with Casper, you know, when every, how, what is it? Uh, it seems like every week there's a new. Every eight minutes. Yeah, well, yeah, Firefox. <laughs> every day <laughs> Firefox comes out with a new version. Is that what it is? Okay, every six weeks, new, new Firefox comes out. That's, we'll use that as an example. Um, we have professors that think that we should have that immediately day one it comes out. We don't have to do that anymore. The tech in that area has the rights to do that, to make that. They have Composer because it's part of our license agreement. Everyone can have Composer. The tech can make a a um, package, a DMG of, of Firefox with all the settings that they want for that lab. This is the home screen, this is the favorites, this is the bookmarks, whatever. And they can have it in their lab day one after release. Couldn't do that before. They didn't know how to make RadMine packages. They, don't know, they didn't know how to make you know, K-files and all that fun stuff that RadMine had to do. Adobe up installs and updates. I think Casper's by far the easiest uh, way to build Adobe Update. You got the Amy tools. We use the Amy tools with Casper. Um, but, you know, to be able to push Adobe Updates from your central server, you can give users limited rights on the machine, make a standard user, and they can still update Adobe through self-service. And you just package that all up into one big Adobe installer and notify them, hey, there's a new Adobe out. And they can go ahead and click and update to 5.5, version 2, 3, whatever. And OS packaging. Um, you know, we're able, we have dual boot environments. 
we're able to package up uh, windows in dual boot and put the boot picker on top of it. We can put the Mac OS down, the windows down. That was something we couldn't do before. Not, not, um, not distributed and not across campus like we do now. Software update servers. This is something we always got in trouble with in the past. We'd build that monolithic image. In the monolithic image, we turned off updates because we didn't want updates running in the labs because we were afraid yeah, it might break something. New Java comes out, it breaks banner. Everyone have that? Is that just me? Okay, everyone has that? All right. So now with Casper, we can push software updates mid-semester. So we, we have them turned off in the image, or in, in the base OS. But when that new Java came out, the 2012, that fixed some bugs, some holes, security holes, you know, we wanted to get that out mid-semester. We downloaded it, we tested it on our Macs, and got the banner OK. We were able to push that to the labs just by setting a policy to run software update, go. Like two check boxes in Casper. And all labs across campus got that Java update. We couldn't do that before. And that's, that's, that's a real game changer too because back before that, you'd almost have to go and touch each machine, run software update, or, or ARD to them, run software. When I say touch, it's not necessarily physically touch. It could be through ARD, but with Casper, you already have the group set up and you just say, all my labs, run this software update, go. Self-healing. Self-healing is a nice tool. Um, when you build a package, so I have, I build Office as one big package, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, as I think most people do. If you index that package, so Casper knows, the JSS knows every piece, every file that's part of that package, if you index that, you can use a self-healing function. So if fluffy user, she, she goes out and she deletes Word, just Word, just Word.app. That's all she deletes because she had to have admin rights on her machine and now she's deleted the Word app. You don't have to just put, you don't have to reinstall the entire Office suite. If you have self-healing turned on because you know she's a problem user, have it checking, <laughs> it'll say, oh, she deleted Word.app. There it is. It's back. Nice feature. Good for labs, too. That's, we use some of that uh, as our deep freeze replacement as well, use some self-healing features. And uninstall. Again, if you index something and you put it down with Casper, you can take it off with Casper. Most of it is, we, we use an all DMG workflow, very few packages in our workflow. So we know this DMG has these files and they're in these places, <coughs> well, take them off. So if we do do something that is bad and broke, banner, we can unbreak banner by uninstalling it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a feature that other ones have. And again, self-service for end-user installs, it's great. By default, when our users log in with um, AD, they're a standard user. They have to submit a ticket and justify why they should be an admin user. It's real easy for them to be an admin user. They just have to say, I want it. Nah, I want it. So, but by default, they are standard users. Everything then can be run through self-service. So we'll package up stuff for them. <coughs> I had set aside time here for a demo. I won't do a demo because I've just seen too many problems with them, especially with the network here. I won't be able to phone home to mine. So what I'd really like to use this time for is more of an open discussion boff. I know we have a lot of Casper users here. Um, if you have a scenario that you'd like to talk through with this group, I think this would be a great opportunity for that. Um, kick it off to the, anyone have a question. Ah, yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, if you have a machine that's like powered off, and you yes. try to push out an update to it, how does it handle Great question. So there's two ways of pushing something. We'll, we'll say, I won't get into semantics of push versus pull, but there's two ways to get something there. There's using Casper Remote Tool. You can say, I want this machine to have this package and this script. Go. 
and it'll try. I think it tries three times. If it doesn't get it, it stops. It tells you it couldn't, couldn't do it. There is also anything you can do with remote, you can also do with a policy. So in the JSS, you set a policy, and it looks exactly the same. Same screen, same checkboxes. I want this to happen. I want to install this app and this script and this printer to this machine, and I want it to try until it fails. I mean, well, not, not, not fail, try until it succeeds. So it'll keep looking, keep looking. When that machine finally checks into your JSS, it'll run that policy. So policies are the best way if you want to make sure what you're pushing gets out to everyone. There's also a log with that. You can see which ones got it, which ones didn't. The ones that didn't, you can track down and say, all right, you have not been on. I, I actually have an inventory uh, search I call long lost Max. And it searched for, for Macs who haven't checked into the JSS in the last, I think it's 45 days. And, you know, we have professors that take their MacBooks and go off to Africa for two semesters. They're in there. Um, but with, with policies, the minute that professor comes back to campus, they're going to get all the policies that they should have had while they're away. Great, great question. It's kind of related to that. So they have to check into like an internal network? You can put your JSS uh, in open facing and they will check in. There's also a way to, there's um, white papers on putting a limited JSS in your DMZ that allows them to check back. So you're running multiple JSSs. So you have your master that sits behind your firewalls. You have a limited one that sits in your DMZ. They talk to each other and that one talks out to the world. Right. So yeah, in that case, you'd put one in the DMZ, and that's the nice thing about the Casper licensing. You know, I run a test server, and I run my production server, and I'm not paying two licenses. I'm paying one license. If I put one in the DMZ, I'm not paying three. I'm paying one license. I mean, you can talk to Scott and and uh, Mike out there, and they'd be talk more about numbers. But you know, I have. Casper Remote on every Tech's Mac on <coughs> campus, 50 some Techs have Casper Remote. I'm not paying per install, I'm paying one license, one, one bill of a year. My true up every year. So you can run multiple instances of your JSS. Are you guys running anything public facing? No, we've talked about doing the um, DMZ one, but you know, we, we've never really needed it, to be honest. So we're using Recruit Manager, we have to, you know, for each classroom, we have to set up the printing using the window sharing. Do you have to do it by window sharing in Casper, or can you use just the regular server of 2008? Okay, to repeat the question for the video, um, you run Windows print servers, yeah. and you need to get those printers distributed with Casper. Short answer is yes, you can, because we run Windows print servers as well. Uh, you have to authenticate AD, and you'll see when you're logged in, if you add a new printer, you'll see all the printers that show up in our print server. So what you would do is you would build one of those out on your test Mac. And what, uh, what I haven't mentioned, the way we do our, our workflow, I have a, an i7 iMac that sits on the desk behind me, and I run... Uh, VMware Fusion 4, and I have virtual uh, 10.7s running in my VMware. I have those snapshotted, so when I want to install any kind of package, I launch Composer or my VM that has a snapshot, install, in this case, a printer, and then use uh, Casper Admin to capture that printer, and then if there's any print drivers, I'll throw those in Casper Admin. Then, when I'm done with that, I'll revert to my VM snapshot. And I know I'm not answering your question, but I will get to it. I just wanted to, while I was thinking of this. So my workflow is a fresh, clean machine every time I install a package, or every time I capture a package. So that's a 
really good workflow. It's worked well for us. But in your case, so, all right, we have our VM. We installed our printer from the Windows print server. We use Casper Admin at that point to capture that printer and, and get it in the printers group in Casper Admin. If there's drivers, so if it's an HP, you want to make sure you have the HP <coughs> Universal driver in your admin as well. Then you would build a self-service policy that says this printer and this driver and call it, you know, HP 5200 in the library second floor. And you could push that or you could deliver that through self-service to any of your users that need that printer. Or you could push it out yourself with a policy or, or with Casper Remote. And we do that all the time. We do Ferros printers for our labs and AD Windows printers for our faculty staff. Does that enable you to do settings on the printers, like if there's a duplexer or an extra paper tray? Yeah, we've, um, a lot of times with that, we have to um, capture cups settings. So depending on the printer, depending on um, how it does its back end, we've had a couple sharps where we had to actually make changes, do a snapshot with Composer, make changes to cups, and then figure out what happened when we changed uh, that. I've had this anyway. with like the LPF yeah. and yep. out that's the another way. It really depends on the easier. printer manufacturer. Some are yeah. easier than others. Okay. We've not been happy with sharps. That's a really good question. So the question is, how do you find the balance of testing your packages before you deploy them and not waste a lot of time testing, but have enough confidence that that package is, is going to work and not break every Mac on campus? Well, again, we start with a always, 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 always start with a fresh system when you make a package. Do not have an iMac that you did a composer capture, installed Windows, or installed, Win installed Office, Microsoft Office, close that capture, get your snapshot, make your package, and then start a new snapshot and install Adobe, and then start a new snapshot. Don't do that. Best practice for us, VM snapshot. Install one image, capture it, make your DMG, revert to the snapshot. Another package build, revert to snapshot. That's why the VM is great in Fusion 4 and 10.7, the licenses allow you to do this, make use of it. It's, it's the best workflow we've had. Because before, we used to have to re-image the machine after we made a packet. We'd have a, a base OS we'd re-image to from a local restore partition so it was a little faster. And then once we get the package, our testing, um, to be quite honest, my testing is I have a very small lab um, it's a technology support services owned lab. That's my, that's my guinea pig lab. And there's 12 machines or so in there. I put it out there and I wait for someone to complain. <laughs> <laughs> Banner's working? Okay. And then I can push it out. Then, then, then I can announce to the campus, okay, this is available for distribution. And there is a testing setting you can put on packages too so people aren't deploying while you're testing. Yes? <laughs> Sometimes you can test on your own machine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you if you want to test on your, yeah. Well, that's why. I mean, I, if you're going to buy a hundred Max for a lab, buy a hundred and one, and use that one as your building machine. I mean, just put that in your PO that you need an extra one. And make sure it has an SSD drive in it. Yes. <laughs> faster the better. Any amount of packaging, SSD will make your life. I7 SSD. Yes. Get it the fastest thing you can. Go ahead. Question on. Uh, VMware and it only doesn't uh, netboot. So do you, it's like if you want to use that for testing, would you have you figured out a way to put a Casper image on there? Oh, um, no, we don't. If, if yeah, my my iMac that I test on does have a partition. It's partitioned out to many different scenario partitions. I have a. 10.6 faculty staff partition that I can boot into and push a package to and see how that breaks it and 
Um, but yeah, I don't do the testing. I only, I only use the VM for the building of the packages, not the testing. More? Got to have some more. What time, uh, what time is it? Kitchen attributes, sort of things that you have tips and tricks for folks here in the audience. Yes. Um, so extension attributes are a, a really good way to refine your inventory to your particular um, scenario, if you will. What we use, we use extension attributes. We have one that's called, I forget what it's called. I think it's like machine type, we call it. Is it, and, and the choices there are podium, lab, faculty, staff, training. I mean, there's different. So we use an extension attribute to say, well, here's all of our podium machines, because they have to be treated a little different than lab machines. Um, we use, ex oh, we use an extension attribute for assigned tech. So we pull in the 50 or so assigned uh, techs that we have, and we have an extension attribute, so they can make a group of the machines that they manage just by that extension attribute, because we may have a group of machines that are in, you know, one tech's managing College of Ed building, and they're managing, you know, the post office building, and they're, so, you know, we're small, so we have a lot of buildings that one person could be responsible for. They're all smart, but, smart grouped by, this is the COE group, this is the post office, this is the College of Business group, but that extension attribute enabled that tech to make a, these are my Mac group, and they may be pulling from, because we may have a College of Ed lab that's in a different building that they don't manage. So they were able to, that was one of the things that helped them kind of get a handle on the Macs that they're responsible for. Yes? So if, if everyone heard her, she makes an extension attribute to check for people doing malicious things like taking out RAM and resetting open firmware. And then alerts her with an email, which is great. That's a, that's a good one. We use, uh, we use extension attributes to track versions of applications that don't show up in applications. For instance, like Flash and like Java right. recently. So that if you do a, a check on the CF bundle version, the info about plist for a particular application, it'll give you the version number. You can check on that and you build a, a smart group. If okay. somebody has this application that's not this version, then they're going to be scoped for the upgrade to the next version. So just to check security, or for security purposes, for Flash and that's, especially. That's a perfect use. And, and that's, that goes to the bigger issue with, with the Casper suite you're able to do things like, I mean, they have all these inventory options out of the box and then they give you this wild card and say, what do you need it for? Just whatever. And, and on jamfnation.com, all these people that are making these wild card extension attributes to help their workflow and refine, you know, to what they need it to do exactly are sharing. We're all sharing this on Jamf Nation. I hope we're all sharing this on Jamf Nation. Um, it's one of the reasons we love Casper versus anything else is the community is second to none. That if you post something on Jamf Nation, how do I do this? You will get five or six good responses pretty quickly. And they're always monitoring with their own, um, with their own uh, text as well from Jamf. Yes? Yeah. Is that all you have to do is just like uncheck it in system preferences? I'm sorry, say that again? You wanna, you wanna, Turn off the remote monitoring uh, feature. You just have to uncheck that in system preferences. And well, if if you give them admin rights, yeah, they could turn off SSH. They could turn off. Um, they could turn off remote yeah, desktop. You just want to use all the other features. You just don't well, no, because you'll need SSH for it to communicate with the JSS. It's okay to have SSH on just the uh, remote desktop yeah. piece. Yeah. 
Uh, screen sharing will still work with that turned off, won't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, is, okay. Okay. So yeah, I guess you could. Do you need SSH for Casper Remote though? For Shout? Uh, no, only if you're using DNC. Okay. So you don't need, once you get them reconned, you can turn SSH off yeah, of the box? Okay. That's, hey, I learned something too. <laughs> what do you do on iOS devices when somebody replaces, you know, has, has one broken, gets it replaced by Apple? Does Casper just, you know, it's an all provision with backed off, you know, maybe say be the iCloud or to, you know, some other, you know, local, when it comes back, will it be off, the new one be on and we'll get inventory or do we have to read? Inventory you'll, or, you know, or re get them to you know, get another enrollment? Yeah, you'll have to re-enroll that device because it won't, it, it's device specific and you'll have to put that device in whatever group you had it in before, um, whether it's a smart group based on name. Um, yeah, it, it'll, you'll have to treat it like a whole new device and then delete their old one out of there because it won't delete itself. You'll have to delete the old one. That's true. If you don't have to, yeah, what Brian's saying is you don't have to delete out of your inventory because you may want that history of what that old one was sure, serial number. Mark commented that this is this is now a a dead. You know, make comments on that. It's, you know, it's a extension a, extension attribute. Make a make an extension attribute that says active or retired. And turn that to a retired. That's true. You could rename it whatever dash expired. And that's, yeah, there's, there's about a million ways to do any one thing with Casper. That's why I love getting these groups together to see how you're doing it, how I'm doing it. Go ahead. Um, we, we're not using it right now as far as right. imaging for variety of reasons, but we are having a devil of a time getting a buy-in group of flash drives to not be unbelievably horribly slow. Like, you know, trying to off spotlight entirely, they're just awful and they're not worth it. And have you been running into the same problem? Uh, we, well, we have some buildings that just can't netboot. Just the wiring or something, you know, there's, there's a ghost in the shell somewhere that just will not let them netboot. We do deploy boot keys. Uh, I haven't heard any complaints of that. I know when we were building our netboot images, they were getting bloated and we couldn't figure out why. And there's some, there's a um, hidden file that's called, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, hit me offline, I'll, I'll remember it. After, right, as soon as this is over, I'll remember what it's called. But it actually bloated our image. It, it's that whole recovery um, that 10.7 can do. It writes this file that almost is the entire OS again in one file. Oh, is it like the snapshots? Uh, yeah, I forget exactly what, the, but as soon as you find that one file and delete it, it cut our image in half, physical size. And maybe that's slowing it down if it's filling up your key, I don't know. But no, we haven't had personally any problems with USB boots. It's not over time, it's just fine. Yeah. Has anyone else had a problem seeing USB key slowness when you try to boot 10.7? Of course, with this new, you can target them too. Do that target disk mode, have your master laptop and do a target disk mode with Thunderbolt and image them that way too. More scenarios. Here's one up here. Is there a way you can register the device before they enroll? Yeah. With your network? IOS, IOS. Register it. Uh, enroll. enroll them. Yes. You can, um, you can download the enrollment profile and use like Configurator to um, put that enrollment profile on the device when you're setting it up. And then they're, they're, all, they're enrolled when they come up. We're not doing that yet. That's something. I want to get into more. Right now we do um, a URL enrollment. We just have them go to Casper slash enroll on our network and run through the steps. <coughs> but there are a way to push configuration profiles with yeah. configuration. Is there a way to limit the enrollment for iOS 5 and above? Scott, I'm going to... Yes. Is there a way to <laughs> limit enrollment for just iOS 5 devices, not iOS 4? I'm not thinking there is, but... I think when you do a normal profile, there's options for iOS 4, iOS 5. Yeah. 
you have to be specific about who you allow to enroll? So there are ways to limit it. I don't know if you can just say I was I'm sure we can do something custom where we, we disable the ability, but that would be a tight custom solution. Yeah, I think I think out of the box there's not. Good question. Yes. So everyone that uses your computers is on AD, so they already have an account created. So Correct. what if you have like a fleet of laptops that aren't on you know any network aren't you know right. network accounts? You want them to create just generic user accounts. Okay. You know, what's the best way to do that? If they're all we want them to create their username, we kinda like to do an automatically generated password when it's kind of uh, well, I mean, you have account management in Casper where you can say um, build these accounts on these machines and local accounts. Uh, so you could do that. You want you want the user to build their. Well, we can tie it in the LDAP. They do have LDAP, but the stu our students are not active directory at all. Okay. So you know, I could I could tie it in the LDAP. Is there a way to like automatically generate a password for them? Is there? Well, that's that might even be beyond. Mind scope knowledge. Okay, so you have an LDAP for your users, and you want to be able. To, is there a using the LDAP plugin for OS 10? I mean, if you if you come up with a, is there a way to bind them to your LDAP? Is I guess my. Oh yeah, we don't. We don't bind. That's so how you don't. I don't know if there is or not. That might be a directory services question. I, that's a little bit. Yeah, um, so you have an LDAP directory where your user accounts are stored. It's not AD, it's, it's an LDAP directory. And you want to be able to, the same way we use AD to just have a username and password prompt, and when they log in, it creates the account form, you want to be able to do that from your LDAP. Is that correct? Yeah. While not connected. While not connected, yeah, while not bound, bound to it. We would use LDAP to create a, a specific username for that. Okay. You could probably use the locations field and somehow remap that to identify who your user is. So tie the Casper suite into the, the LDAP for user authentication to identify the user. Tie uh, um, an account of that somewhere to the scripts, maybe. But uh, the thing with configuration profiles in 10.7 are that they do have passcode policy options. So you can say okay. like, the passcode has to be character, it has to expire. Well, I'm just worried that if you don't automatically create a password for them, you're going to create whatever you want. You know, you right. Okay, so. So you could just require the machine to have a complex passcode. That would be the best way to do it. Okay, so the answer there to repeat for the video is using configuration profiles of 10.7, set a complex password on that machine, require complex, so any user that logs in, regardless of where they're coming from, would have to put a complex password. Is that right? Is that pretty much what we're saying? Just getting it on video. <laughs> yes? Does Casper allow you to drop key servers? Because you may have a license for 100, and key servers huh. prevent somebody from the 100 and want right. long. You're allowed 101. You're in violation of your agreement. Then I guess what Casper says, "Oh, you went over one." And that's kind of like a gray area. We actually went to our lawyer, our, camp, our university attorney, for this and said, "Read this, Eula, because <laughs> we can't. It's legalese." If we did it this way, would we be in compliance? And specifically like the Adobe ones, and uh, we have a campus license for Microsoft, so that wasn't an issue, but uh, like FileMaker, you know, things like that. His answer was, as long as we're making best effort to m comply and to monitor and to check, we were, we were fine legally. So, so, you get, so if you do, well, how do you monitor that? Or what kind of feedback do you get? It can send you an email. Yeah, yeah, it can email an admin and say, uh, you said 20 license, I see 21 running. I see 121 running <laughs> by 100 more. Um, but it, yeah, it's not, it's, it's more passive and it's just alerting you. It's, I like that idea because if you ever key Adobe. Oh, it's horrible. And that was, I didn't even mention how, yeah. 
being able to install Adobe apps without keying them first, it, it will take weeks of your life back where you can go golfing and fishing and <laughs> blah, ah, it's just, it's, it was horrible. Not to mention you can store the serial numbers from JSS where you find them free. Exactly. So it'll... Go with it here. Okay, any of our vendors who do uh, concurrent licensing, they just walk that step. Yep. They know we're buying software. So yep. As long as we look occasionally, they'll be, yeah, we've got So you're safe if, if you can get rid of keys. And, and we have SCCM on our Windows side. And with the success of Casper, they said, oh, yeah, well, we'll do the same thing that Macs are doing. We will do best effort tracking with SCCM, and we totally got rid of key server license. Um, as far as Oh, yeah. And um, they actually told us not to key things anymore. They said that if it's installed, it'll, it'll monitor, but they said actually physically keying the executable, they're no longer recommended. We oh, great. We didn't find out until we specifically talked yeah, about that. Yeah, we see that once, once you key Adobe, you forget about any kind of updates. Exactly. Exactly. Which was, which was why we, that was one of our big goals on the whiteboard, get rid of keyed apps. Use Casper to get rid of keyed apps. Yes. And, and same is true in Casper. It can be tricky tracking. Yeah. It can be tricky to track them. Um, same thing. You've got to get your license just right. And, and, and the nice thing with Casper is I have, we have a software manager. She has an account in Casper, very limited. She just views software reports. So any, at any time, she can go and look at software reports. An email goes to software at appstate.edu. If there's an issue, a violation, it goes to her, not to me. Great. Takes me out of the loop. What's, oh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that you have SCCM for the Windows side, so do you use the Jam plugin to integrate with that? Uh, we don't. There is, what, he, what he's asking is there's an SCCM conduit that Jamf provides. We are probably going to do that soon. What that does is takes your inventory in, in, in your JSS in Casper and pushes it over to SCCM so you have a unified inventory over there. I think it does some other stuff too, Scott. I'm not sure exactly what. Just inventory? Okay. The reason we're thinking of going to that is we're looking at Microsoft's um, ticketing system for help desk ticketing, and that pulls inventory from SCCM, but we're not sure if it'll pull from Casper. So we can just push our stuff to SCCM, and then the ticketing system would have asset inventory inside. So user, we could tie a user to an asset and stuff. Yes? Uh, question on scale. So the 2,000 uh, devices that you have, how many Casper servers do you have and what time? Just one? We have one primary JSS. Okay. It is running, uh, it is an XServe. It was the last of the XServe, so it was the, what, OctaCore Xeon? What's that? No. No, they're just SATA drives. And is it busy? No. Um, it, it's running a MySQL server, Tomcat driven. Um, yeah, what, what really sped our system up was blowing the RAM out, just getting as much RAM as that box would hold, and going into the, uh, the database utility and setting all of the requirements, uh, all the um, MySQL and all the Tomcat settings, set them to 11. Just crank them up, and our speed increased so much. I mean, inventory search, if you do a blank inventory search and get all 2,000 plus machines, it's less than a second. Before we added the RAM and set the settings to 11, it was maybe 15 seconds for an entire search. So that's my biggest recommendation. Just get as much RAM in that primary JSS and turn all the settings up. We have four distribution points, and those are just for... for uh, networking type issues, you know, making sure that we're distributed. There is some automatic failover with the distribution points that's built into the JSS. So if Casper 2 is down, it will fail over to Casper 3 if someone requests something from Casper 2. Uh, automatic backups of your MySQL. So the backup runs every night, gets copied to a backup server, and then we do a time machine backup of that back of our JSS as well. So it's backed up to another server. And so redundancy is, is kind of built in, which is great. 
other questions, scenario? Yes. Anybody in here integrating with Web Help Desk with their Jam solution? Just like to hear how that how that works. Where I would too, it? actually. So the question is: Does anyone use Web Help Desk, and how do they tie it into their JSS? You're, are you a Web Help Desk customer? Yeah, we actually use both, and we um, actually started with Web Help Desk, got Jam second, and basically just exported everything out of Web Help Desk into Jam. Oh, like great. Still, still use it for ticket. Great. So what, what, that, what they're asking in the, in the web help desk can take the asset, same thing like I was talking with the JSS conduit to SCCM. Um, you take your assets, you put them in your ticketing system from Casper so you can assign an asset or a machine to a user so when they submit a ticket you know they're on an iMac and it's this and it's got this OS on it. That's great. And uh, it, Jamf has a lot of, you know, third-party partners, if you will. I know Web Help Desk is one of them, and uh, Crash Plan. I know you guys do a lot with Crash Plan. So, that that was one of the things in my slide. You know, we wanted someone who kept up to date with the Apple community, and, and Jamf really does that. Those devices are, are those students' personal devices. The devices that you manage are they are those students. Uh, we, we do not have any students in our JSS. Uh, personal owned Macs are not. I, I've talked with um, our engineers at, for, from, well actually I talked to our sales rep at, at Jamf about could we give self-service to students and not have to pay like the full licensing for management. We just want to be able to like have them get like the Pharos installer. You know, if I have my Mac laptop that's personally owned, it's a student machine, I want to print to the Pharos print servers. Right now we don't have a really good way to do that because you need these drivers, these installers. If we could give them self-service, it would be great. And you know, they could just install apps that we, you know, want them to install. What was their answer? Um, we can work out a license. I mean, they're, they're real flexible. They're, the answer was, yeah, we could probably work out a licensing agreement, but that's a good company. Yes? Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, your, your, your cost will vary with commercial, ver but I think majority of us are education. What he, to repeat what he's saying is that the, the cost for a license in education, again, in our, in our scenario, it's less than a third of a full-time employee. And we're not paying the JSS any benefits. It doesn't need, you know, it's, it's vacation and it's longevity pay. It just sits there and runs all the time. Yeah, so the commercial licenses are probably maybe double. Uh, so you're talking two-thirds of a... Right. And we're much happier with Casper. <laughs> yeah. So again, don't 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 go to your departments with the argument that I need Casper, and we can you know cut people, because it, it's not a good argument. The argument is, I know our Mac population will grow. I've seen it grow, personally, from 400 to 2,000 in four years. I have not added any additional staff in those four years. We're still the same two guys, well, a new, still two of us, one of them's new, um, that did this with 400 max, we're doing this with 2,000 max. It scaled up, and without Casper, we easily would have had to add at least one full-time person as we scale. And that's not even counting the iOS devices, which are now about 20% of my install base are iOS devices, and by next year it'll probably be 50% of my install base will be iOS devices. And again, we're still going to be the same two guys that we were four years ago running all this, and the same 50 people in the field that are fixing all of this. We're not, we're not growing staff. North Carolina is broke. We know we're not growing. So, what? No, we haven't had a raise in years, but that's off topic. <laughs> um, but, you know, with Casper, we're, 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 we're going to do more. We're going to be asked to do more. We know we're going to be asked to do more. Casper makes it easy. That's why Mac management made easy. Without it, we would be lost.
Yes. Yeah, after, after the fact. We, what's that? Yeah, yeah, it works with it works with Pharonix pro That's one of their third parties that that um, there's white papers on Jamf Nation on how to work, use deep freeze. I believe there are. Correct me if I'm wrong, Scott. But yeah, Pharonix works great with Casper. If you want to keep deep freeze, and it's a great product. I have. We were just really looking where we can save money, and if we could do it with Casper, why not? So what he's saying is you can you can schedule all that with your JSS, schedule the thaw, install, re refreeze, and your backup. Any other questions? We've got about five more minutes. Can you talk a little bit about the process for getting your own managed Max and the Active Directory? Um it it was it was IT's decision. We we started, you know, that was Novell was another thing we were trying to get rid of, save money. Our, our Novell will be turned off. If it, it might already have been turned off last week or this week, but yeah, it's it it ran for thirty years, you know, or whatever, um, <laughs> and it's not been updated. No, so we we had e directory, we had open directory. And we started moving to Active Directory. So in the cleanup process, we said we have to get the Max on board because if you have, if you're forcing the PC world to do this, and they're going to be pointing, going, "Well, why, why is Mac not doing it, huh?" You know, like little kids, little siblings there. So we said, let's just do it across the board. Get our Macs in line. The process we go through. The only problem we have is if they were a good user and they actually built a local account with their short name that is their right short name, the fluffy Macs are easy. You can do the fluffies all day long, back up the data, um, or just create a new account and migrate the data over, no problem. The ones that we've had problems with were had a local account named the same as their short name in AD. Um, you, we, we try to schedule those with a 10.7 upgrade and just do an entire backup and, and re-image and migration. If, if you'd like, give me your contact and I'll share any gotchas that we found with you. But that's been our biggest gotcha. If we try to bind a Mac that already has a short name on it, it would break our logins. Don't know why, but it broke our logins. Um, so no one could log into the machine. It took us a while to figure out why. And then we say, oh, these are all, all these that break already had a short name. And when we did the bind and they tried to log in, it broke something. And I'm, I'm not a directory services master by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a Mac admin. AD came in, and I was like, all right, I guess i got to learn AD. So we're learning as we go. We renamed the home folder, deleted the reference for it, then logged them in, and okay. stage-modded it, and then copied everything over. Okay, so what he's saying is they had to rename their home folder, um, say, delete the reference, delete the reference the old name. to the old name, then have them log in. If it actually creates the mobile user, chmod everything. Copy okay. Code. So then have them log in, create a new user, uh, chmod everything, and back up, and and then move the data. And that's very similar to what we have to do: back up and reinstall. So we got less than five minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and oh, one one last last one. This will be the last one. Yes. I mean, you, you can script anything. If, if you know paths to data and you write a, uh, uh, an MV script or, a, or, or a, uh, yeah, what, what are some of the other um, copy scripts, CP or whatever, um, or SCP. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can script everything. So have a, a script that runs before that does the copy and then the image starts and then a script at the end that copies it back. Uh, last, real quick, cash for resources. Um, we talked about these some in other sessions, but Jamf Nation, absolutely join. Um, they have some CCA courses. And the administrator guide, let me just say that is the best uh, tech doc I've ever had from any company. I can hand that to someone, say, read this, and you will know how to do the JSS 
as well as I do if you just read the manual. We'll leave it at that. Oh, whoa, whoa, sorry, sorry, sorry. JamfSoftware.com, JamfNation.com. CCA is a certified Casper administrator. I've taken the course. It is wonderful. If you run Casper, take the course. It's a CMA and take, yeah, there's a CMA now, certified mobile administrator. Uh, definitely take those courses. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.